All right. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good. Good. Beautiful morning, right? All right. Good, good, good. So glad to see each and every one of you out there. Uh, and so glad that you're with us this morning. Let me get a couple of announcements out of the way. If you are a guest this morning and you're here for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or fifteenth time, okay, we are so glad to have you. If you're a regular tender or member, always good to see your faces as well. We know how the summertime can be a little bit uh, dicey, can't it? You know, people in and out so much, but that's okay. We know how it is. Um, I do want to give a few announcements before we get started today. Uh, number one is this. Um, we are going to have a ministry meeting on Wednesday, June the 15th at 7 o'clock. Some people call that business meeting. We don't call it business meeting. It's more of a ministry meeting. So um, whether you're a guest, regular attender, or anything of that nature, you're more than welcome to join us for that. Vacation Bible School starts uh, June the 20th and goes through the 24th. Now, I know you're already praying about this, and we are really, really anticipating some kids here, right? Yeah, we are. And we're also anticipating kids to be ministered to, maybe some families that don't have a church home. Uh, but more than that, we're praying that people will be brought into the kingdom because of Vacation Bible School. That's what we pray for the most, for hearts and souls to be lifted up and saved. And so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and continue, if you're not already doing that, to pray for Vacation Bible School coming up June the 20th. And then uh, today is a special day. Uh, it's a day for a special offering. You've seen that in the emails. We've talked about it on Sunday mornings. We are going to take up a special offering at the end of the service, and that is for the purpose of getting started a fund, um, a fund for replacing our air condition, two air conditioners, and also our roof. Okay, it's always good to have a roof over your head. And it's always good to have one that doesn't leak. Okay, so we. <laughs> So we are uh, taking up some funds to help repair that and replace it, okay? And, and today's offering is just to get that started, okay? So uh, we'll do that at the end of the service. I'll be talking about it during the service. But uh, if you're ready to worship, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. We're going to begin doing that this morning. Uh, we move into the most important part of the service, and that's when we lift up hearts, minds, all that we are to the Lord in song and prepare ourselves to hear from his word and get a touch from the Holy Spirit. So I pray and trust you're seeking that this morning as we gather together. Okay, Father, thank you. We know that whenever we gather in your house or anywhere else on the planet, that you're present because you're everywhere. You're always present. But Lord, this morning, we want to ask you to be here with us, Lord. We desire your presence. We long for your presence, Lord. Sometimes we even thirst for a taste from you. And so this morning, God, I'm here, Lord. For those who can't make it, Lord, we pray for them as well. Lord, if they're sick, that you'll heal them. And Father, we pray for those traveling today. And Jesus, we want to lift you up and give you all the praise you deserve. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Remain standing. Let's start this morning's worship. You all know this song. You sang it many times. Ladies, you're in the presence of men. You're in the not friends. So let's give it a shot. All right. You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will listen. I will love.
You 
posted on social media this week I saw where someone was willing to trade five five gallon gases of can, uh, gasoline for down payment on a home <laughs> you've probably heard this saying before money talks the only thing it says is goodbye okay and we all know that no one needs to remind us this morning of the cost of things or the costs of things you know, one of the biggest complaints that some people have about church is that they're always talking about collecting and handling money. And, you know, I, I've never really seen that, to be honest with you. I've never really seen a church anywhere that is constantly focused on money or collections or things like that. Um, sometimes a church may overemphasize it. Um, but you, you can never really get out of people what they're not willing to give. You can't get what they don't have, okay? So whenever you talk about funding or gatherings or gifting or anything of that nature, you know, there are things that the Bible talks about that we're going to look at this morning. You know, the Bible says a lot about money. It talks about how to manage it. How to steward the money. It talks about how to 
give it away. It talks about how to save it. If you've never looked at the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs tell you a lot about how to manage money and resources. So, you know, sometimes take a look back. Go back and look at some of the things Solomon talks about, you know, the wealthiest man that ever lived, how he talks about managing, resourcing, giving, saving money. Go back and look at some of those things. You may not be aware of this today, but Jesus talked more about money than he talked about heaven or hell. How many of you knew that? Anybody know that? Okay, a couple of you did. Um, he did. He talked more about money than he did about heaven or hell because he knew that money, that resources were things that people struggled with a lot, especially in the spiritual context. We're going to go back and look at the Old Testament for a few minutes this morning before we get to Exodus 35. And, you know, God's plan for resourcing his ministries and properties are the gift of his people, the gifts of his people. And so, in other words, um, the only real outlines that we have in the scripture about funding ministry and and uh uh, things, the things of the Lord are the gifts of God's people, although everything comes from God's hand. Um, these come in the form of offerings and gifts. When you see, um, and we're going to look at this today, when you see God, how when God commands that people or leads people, when Jesus teaches about money, that these things are, they, they come from people's hands, okay? They come from the resources that people have. Well, let's go back to the Old Testament for a minute because there are five basic kinds of offerings that would, let's look at them real quick, okay? Before we look at the um, offering that we're going to talk about this morning. First of all, there was the burnt offering. You know, we I don't think anybody needs uh, to tell us this morning, we don't need to remind each other how quick our money goes up in flames, Right? How quickly we can burn through money. We can go through, we can burn through it very quickly. But that's not what the burnt offering was about. It wasn't about people bringing offerings and God setting them on fire, okay? The burnt offering was brought um, so that people, they would bring a goat or a bull or an animal that was clean and purified and fit, and they would bring that, and that offering would be burnt or roasted all night long for the sins of people. That's why it was called the burnt offering. And then there was also the grain offering. And this is where you would take bread and you would roast it, bake it, fry it, fire it in some way into some kind of cereal-like material. That's how we might relate to it today. It would be like a, a, a cereal, like Special K. Okay, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of what Special K might look like. A cereal, kind of like that. And this was um, an offering that was given to commemorate God's providing for people, okay? So they would give special offerings and say, hey God, you know, thank you so much for providing for us. We're sacrificing an offering as a commemoration of that. And then there was also the peace offering. The peace offering was um, not a payment of sin. Um, it was, uh, a, a, once again, they would bring a suitable animal for sacrifice, but it was an offering between two people um, commemorating their future prosperity together. In other words, two people would come together and they would present the peace offering, and in essence what they were doing is saying, I want the best for your future, I want the best for your future and prosperity, and they would make a commitment together with a peace offering. Then there was the sin offering, which wasn't really a payment for sin. The sin offering was more of a purification offering. And that offering was brought and given to God as a way of saying, we want to reset or reinstitute our relationship with you, okay? So it was a sin offering for that reason. Then there was the guilt offering. Now, I don't know about you this morning, but that would be an easy one for most of us because we all probably have some guilt, some feelings of guilt over something. <laughs> Maybe. 
But the guilt offering was also called the trespass offering. And this was a money payment for a debt due to a, due because of a sin. In other words, if I committed a sin against someone, I, I might come to God with that person and offering and offer a guilt offering as a way to bring reconciliation with that, that person because I had committed a sin and violated something against that person. Now, by the way, whenever you did the guilt offering, the priest received a 20% commission for officiating over that offering. So we'll just leave that where it's at, right? <laughs> All right. But then God set up and commanded offerings for the purpose of fundraising certain projects. And so we'll go to Exodus chapter 35 this morning and just read a couple of verses to begin with. Exodus 35, verse 4 and 5, And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying. Now, I want you to note, that this isn't a suggestion, it's not something God said, if you think about it or feel like it, or if you, if you need, he was actually commanding that they do this. So the Lord commanded saying, take from among you an offering of the Lord, or to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Now we're going to get into this a little bit, but every time we give something to God, whether it's time, talent, money, gifts of some kind, resources, God always wants us to bring those to him with a heart that is willing, with an attitude that is pure, okay? With motives that are right. So as we look at that this morning, God had given Israel instructions to build a temple. And this was going to be a temporary place for God to dwell before Solomon built the permanent temple. It was a place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And in case you don't know what that was, it was the Ark of the Covenant contained a, a bowl of manna, a, Aaron's rod that had already budded, and the Ten Commandments. It represented the presence of God, okay? Whenever the Ark of the Covenant was there, it represented God's very presence in front of the people. So it was kept in the tabernacle, in the tent, and eventually in the temple. So God wanted Moses to command the people to take up this offering. But before they built the tabernacle, God was meeting Moses in a tent. Okay, that was a very temporary place for God to meet him. And so now from the tent, they're going to move to the tabernacle, which was going to be much better than the tent, but yet still temporary until Solomon built the temple. So the place where God resided in the Old Testament, he resided three different places, the, the tent, the tabernacle, and the temple, okay? So they're at the stage where they want to build the temple, and God's like, listen, we can't do that without money. Nothing of any... Um, substance in ministry can be done without money. Now we know that God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Everything belongs to God. But we're going to get into some of the reasons in a few minutes why it's important for us to be part of this as givers. You see, when we look at this and other things in the scripture, folks, one of the first insights we get is that God comes first. He is always leading people, Old Testament and New Testament, to put him first. That's why he's God and we're not, okay? Whenever we put God first, we're already acknowledging that God comes before us. Anytime that you give money or resources to anything whatsoever in ministry or God's work, you are showing God that he is coming first in your life. And so when God commanded Moses to have these people take up an offering, one of the reasons why he wanted them to do that is because he wanted them to learn that I come first. It wasn't just about building a tabernacle or eventually a temple. 
It was about making God first in their lives. And let me say this this morning, okay? Whenever we put God first, this is not a cliche. It's not something a pastor would just say. It's the truth. Try it if you don't believe it. When you put God first, everything else will fall in place. When you put God first, everything else will fall in place. Thank you. It will. It's true, isn't it? It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean it works out the way we always want it to. It doesn't mean that every one of your prayers will be answered. But it does mean this, that everything and the will and the purpose and the plan of God will fall in place. That's what it means. It will. Try it. So, part of what they were to learn here is that God was to be first. Now, before they built, the, now listen, before they built their homes, before they planted their vineyards, before they dug their wells, God wanted them to focus on Him and on worship, okay? And, and, and He leads them. Before you do all these other necessities for yourself, I want to be God in your life, and I want to come first. I must come first. So let's all do something this morning, just mentally, okay? Just spiritually. Let's ask ourselves, God, are you first in my, in my life? Uh, is, uh, do I, try, do I do, attempt to do everything I can to place you first in my decisions, in my actions, in, in, in my attitude, in my heart? Am I putting you first? Because that's the place in which God wants to reside. First. Now, there's a lot of things in this chapter, folks, that we can do. Uh, you know, we can dive in. We can unpack them and explain them. Things in this chapter and the preceding chapters and the ones that follow it. But for the sake of the message this morning, we're going to look at just focusing on this offering that God's commanding his people to give and for the purpose of building the temple. It's an offering of commemoration. We're going to focus on that. Now, I've seen all kinds of weird things with fundraising. You know, I've seen people uh, in churches. I've seen all kinds of the stuff. I, some I don't want to talk about, really. I've seen people collect old gym shoes for fundraising. I am not kidding. I've seen people try to raise money for mattresses. I've seen pastors swing from the rafters on cables to try and present some kind of excitement that people will raise money. I've seen guys stand on roofs, and if you give so much money, I won't jump off. Okay? All kinds of... I, I don't... Forgive me if I'm offending anybody. I hope I'm not. But I've seen all kinds of circus tricks in the church to try and raise money. Well, I want you to think about this today, okay, from a biblical perspective. What Moses is doing here, what God is leading him to do, is not a fundraising campaign. It's not. You go back and investigate the scriptures yourself, and if I'm wrong, you come tell me. But never in the scriptures do we see where God leads people to have contests for collecting money. I don't, I, I, I've not seen that, okay? Moses never set up a fundraiser where whoever gives the most money gets a free camel. I've never seen that. I've just never seen it. And, um, you know, uh, he didn't tell them whoever brings, he didn't set up each tribe against one another and say whoever, you know, can, whichever tribe can raise the most money is the winner. He never did that. You know, there weren't thermometers, cardboard thermometers that indicated how much money they collected, although there's nothing innately wrong with that. There were no gold plaques, no special seats in the tabernacle for people who gave the most. None of that stuff. It was simply people bringing resources because they wanted to for the purpose of God's work. That's all it was. And so when you think about that, we've all been involved in some kind of fundraiser over the period of our journey with God that may have been good or bad. I'm not sure. But there are three insights this morning that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at them. They're very simple, very quick, okay? And they're in these verses. So let's look at them, okay? Let's break them down. Let's look at them. Let's just get a very simple elementary look at this. One is this, is take an offering. He says, let's 
Moses, I want you to take from among you an offering to the Lord. First point. Take from among you an offering for the Lord. Okay, that's the first thing we look at. Now, everybody participated in this venture, in this picture. Everybody was participating. Now, when we take up an offering every single Sunday or when we have a special offering like this, you, you can give or not give. We don't keep, you know, we don't police that. Obviously, we record your givings. That's what you want us to do, but we don't police that, okay? In what little promotion we've done with this, we've talked about whether you give $40 or $4 doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But what we see initially this morning is that when God commanded Moses to lead the people to give, they all participated. Take an offering from among you, okay? In that verse, it is not really giving an option for people to be left out. Every one of the Israelites gave something, even though their names are not recorded and the amount they gave. <laughs> they gave something. But the offering that they were giving was a picture of unity and unified purpose. You see, they were giving it for the purpose of building the tabernacle. And the people were unified in their giving. But they were also unified in their purpose. So this morning, we are unified. As, as best I know, we are unified. We are a very healthy church. We are not unanimous on everything, but we are in unity. We're in unity of purpose. And this morning we have a small purpose of giving money to get a fund started to help replace a roof and also some air conditioners. But when we go back and look at this, take an offering from among you, this means voluntarily releasing part of or a portion of your income and resources for the Lord's work. Voluntarily, okay? You see, even though this was a command of God, they were not held hostage in giving. It was a voluntary thing. God doesn't want anyone held hostage with their giving. God doesn't put guilt and shame on people for giving or not giving. Okay? He doesn't do that. Because God simply wants us to do it voluntarily. Now, when we look at some kind of defined definition of, of, of what's happening here. Whenever they gave an offering, they gave it from what they had and according to their ability. And that's very important to note because that's both Old Testament and New Testament that they gave from what they had and they gave according to their ability to give. Although the Bible also speaks of a 10% tithe, which tithe also means 10%. Okay, see they didn't give leftovers. They didn't give from surplus. The things they brought were not goodwill or thrift store items. Now, just real quickly, I've, I've seen this before. Years ago, in a church that we were members of, there was a guy that had, that he, let me be careful. He, he had food that he gave away. He had a business where he gave away food. I'll make it more generic. And we went down there, we were sorting all that out one day, only to find out that most of the food down there had been expired for two to three weeks. And it's like, there's no way we're taking this out and giving this to people. We dumped it in the garbage. So the point is this. If you're going to give something, give something that you would eat. Give something that means something to you, okay? Not the leftovers, the Goodwill or the thrift store stuff, okay? So God was leading them to give. Now I want you to look at verse, I'm not going to read this, I want you to look at it though in verses 6 through 9. Because the things that they were giving were very precious things. They weren't the leftovers. They weren't the things that nobody wanted. The things of no value. When you go back and look at those verses, they were giving gold, silver, bronze, blue, and purple, and scarlet thread. They were giving skins, oil, spices, valuable stones. The onyx stone is mentioned there. Go back and look at that. That's what they were giving. Valuables. 
Listen, folks, it doesn't matter what we give. When we are giving something that we feel is valuable to God, God honors that. He honors your giving. And when you give it with a right heart, God values it as well. So that's what they were giving. Some people gave more than others. You see, listen to this this morning. You see, offerings are not evaluated by the amount. They're, va they're evaluated by the attitude. You can give $3 million to something and have the wrong attitude, and God doesn't see that as honorable. You can give three cents, and that's all you've got, and God honors that. It's not the amount that matters. It's the attitude in which we give that God honors. So, take an offering from among you, okay? That's a little deep, deeper meaning than just that sentence. The second thing is this. It comes from that same scripture, of a willing heart, okay? And this is very important to get this, a willing heart. You see, this, I think this is the beautiful part of this. Man, you can tell when somebody's doing something from the heart, can't you? You can tell oftentimes, if you, especially if you have the gift of discernment, you can tell when somebody's giving that with a rotten attitude or when someone does something with motivation to, you know, for their self. You can tell. But the, I think the beautiful part of this or one of the beautiful parts of it is the fact that they were God said do it with a willing heart. You know what he's saying there, guys? He's saying, in other words, if you can't do it willingly, don't do it at all. That's what he's saying. If you can't do it willingly, then don't do it at all. That's what he's saying. I didn't say that. God did. Will a willing heart. You see, they did it willingly. Now, I want you, I'm going to give you a definition of this, okay? You see, a, here's what a willing heart means. A willing heart means a heart that wants to. That's what a willing heart is. How many of you have, how many of you have ever done something and you did it and you finished it and you completed it, but you didn't want to do it? How many of you? Every day, right? Absolutely. You see, it makes a difference when we want to do something. Have you ever asked someone to do something for you? And they're like, oh, I guess. If I have to. Yeah. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? Then when someone comes to you and says, I'll be glad to do that. The person that says, oh, if I have to, you, you just want to say, all right, forget it, right? And that's kind of what God does. He's like, if you feel like you have to, just forget it. I don't need your stuff anyway. That's kind of what God says. So a willing heart means a heart that wants to. A heart that wants to do it. You see, people will do what I just believe people are going to do what they're going to do. I, I just believe that. I've been around people and dealing with people, leading people, ministering to them for over 35 years. And I just believe for the most part, people are just going to do what they want to. They're going to. It doesn't matter what you say, how much you preach. And it doesn't matter. People are going to do what they want to do. And so God is saying, listen, if you really want to give or be a part of this offering, then you're going to. And if you don't, then I don't want it. In essence, that's what he's saying. Can you imagine what it takes to give something that you don't have to give? You see, I want to believe that some of these people gave what, probably what they didn't have. Maybe what they couldn't afford. And there are people that give in churches all over the world that give what they don't have, what they, what they can't afford. Many times. Maybe you have at some point in your life as well. But I do know that when people give because they want to, they're much more committed to what they're giving. And by the way, when you have skin in the game, how many of you know what that means, skin in the game? Okay, it doesn't mean like you're peeling off skin. It doesn't mean like you're dripping blood on something. But when you have skin in the game, you're much more committed to it. And skin in the game simply means I've got an investment. <laughs> I've got part of my life here. I've got skin in the game. Three things here under a willing heart. Number one is it proves your love. There's nothing that proves your love more than when you give something. 
doesn't matter the value, doesn't matter the size of the gift, doesn't matter exactly where it came from, but giving is an expression. Maybe giving is the highest expression of a person's love towards something or someone. The highest expression to give. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. The highest. You see, for God there was nothing, nothing more that he could give. And nothing less would do than to give his very best. For God so loved the world that he gave when he didn't have to. He gave maybe when he should not have, to, have had to. But he gave. And it proves our love. We go out of our way I mean, man, isn't that something when somebody goes out of their way to do something for you? I think it is. You go out of your way to do it. Something you don't have to do proves your love. Second thing, shows that you want to be obedient. You see, give, once again, giving is never about the amount of money. Oftentimes, Becky and I will talk about something and it'll relate in some way to finances or something of that nature. And I, I will often tell her it's not about the money, it's about the principle. It's the principle of the thing, not about the money. But it shows obedience. And you know what, folks? Whenever we give something, it, it shows who we are obedient to, me or God. Every time you give something, you are showing God that your obedience to Him transcends, supersedes, your obedience to yourself. When you peel off something or you write something out and you give it to God, you're saying, I'm doing this with a willing heart and obedience to you, God. And that's what he was asking the people to do. To do it out of obedience, he said. I'm commanding you to do it, but do it out of obedience. He wasn't forcing them to. He wanted them just to simply be obedient to that. You know, one of the hardest things that we, that you and I do sometimes is when we give with a cheerful heart. It's not always easy to hand something over, is it? It's not. Some of you are looking at me like, can't wait till this is over. <laughs> not really. But obedience is a big thing. And it's hard. Listen, it's hard to talk about money in church. I will tell you, in 35 years, every time I've gotten up and talked about money, you just don't know where that's going to go, how that's going to be received, or what you're going to say sometimes. You just don't know. You know why? Because you're getting into some really personal stuff with people when you talk about money. You really are. But this part of it's about obedience. Who am I going to be obedient to? Growing up, I was a very rebellious person. And I'm not even embellishing that or trying to make more out of it just to sound like, you know, the pastor was a really rebellious person. I was. I'll give you my mom's phone number. Okay? She'll tell you. But I grew up with a set of principles in my home, in my family's home, that even though I was a rebellious person, I was still obedient to my mom and dad because I loved them. And I might have been rebellious in some ways, but when it came to my mother and father, I was obedient to them. Or I wish I had been. And God wants you to, he just wants our obedience, our love in return. That's all he wants. Third thing is this. A willing heart proves your love. It shows that you're obedient, and it also reveals ownership. Ownership. You know, did you know that God wants us to live our lives as, as if he owns everything? Because he does. I want you to look real quick at Psalm 24.1. Just write a note down if you need to. This, David said, in, in reference to God, he said, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You know, from a biblical worldview, from a biblical perspective, looking through the lenses of God... I remind myself, my family, remind, we remind ourselves that all everything is God's. The earth is the Lord's and all that's in it. I'm just nothing more than a manager 
a steward of what I have. That's all. It all belongs to God. You know, when you look at Psalm 89, 11, the heavens are yours, Lord, and the earth also is yours. And listen to this. And the world and all it contains. Man, if you want something to set in place for you a biblical worldview, look at those two verses. That the, the everything belongs to God. It's all yours, God. Everything is yours. You created it. You created everything that created it, that created it, that created it. It's all yours. And having a biblical perspective like that makes all the difference in the world. So we've looked at this morning an offering from among you, a willing heart, and then all they had to do was bring it, okay? To bring it. Exodus 35. 20 and 21. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence and everyone who was willing, he says it again, and whose heart was moved, moved, came and brought an offering to the Lord. The heart was moved. Now, after Moses asked them to give, very simple, Moses asked them to give, and what they did was they went back home and they talked about and decided what they were going to give. That's what they did. We've, we've been talking about this for four or five weeks. Try not to make too much of an emphasis on it. But we've asked you to pray. We've asked you to think about what God might have you to give. Nobody's put a monetary uh, amount on anything. No one asked you to give a certain amount or anything of that nature. It's just simply like these three things. To, um, to simply give an offering to the Lord do it with a willing heart, and then just bring it. How much more simple can it be? How much more difficult do we need to make it? And so they were just simply bring, to bring the offering. So they went back home, and they decided what they would give. Moses never told them, he never told them how to give, what to give, or how much to give. Never. Because it has to come from the heart. And so the offering that we give today, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than a starting place. We've done a lot of work on the building in the last four years. A lot. Air conditioners, children's department, the foyer, the flooring, um, and, and on and on. The baptistry, we're putting carpet down at hardly any cost whatsoever. We're doing everything we can to get God's house in order. This is, this is His. We want to make it the best that we can make it for God, don't we? Yeah, sure we do. Why do you think God moved from temple tabernacle or from tent tabernacle to temple? Does God deserve the best? And this is going to be an ongoing fund, okay? We're going to start it today, and it's going to be an ongoing thing because it's going to take time to raise $88,000 for a roof and some air conditioners. It's just going to take time. Some of you have already maybe given something. Some of you, you know, maybe you're going to give today. Maybe you're still thinking about it. That's okay. But today we simply wanted to put a special emphasis on an offering for the purpose of taking care of God's building, God's house of worship, and to keep it in shape, to keep it moving so we can continue to do ministry. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to stand. And you know, the last part of what we look at this morning is to simply bring. Okay? I'm going to move this up a little bit. So, as I thought about this, what I'd like for us to do this morning is if you want to give something, and you, you I mean, you want to give something, I want you to come forward. We've got a little basket set up here. This is a little bit what it might have looked like in the Old Testament, where people just came and gave their offerings into a basket or a, pot, a clay pot, sometimes a, a box or gold box or something of that nature. But um, if you want to give something this morning, I'm going to ask you just to go ahead and start moving out of your seat and come on up here and drop your thing in the your envelope or whatever you have. You know, maybe you brought um, a goat this morning. Maybe you brought uh, an orange one. I don't know. <laughs> We'll make room for it. Um, you have to feed it. But just drop it in here. And, and, and this is not to make you feel bad. If, if, if you didn't, 
you're not ready. Let's say you're not ready for that this morning, or you didn't bring anything, or you already gave. Just come, I want you to come up here anyway, because we're going to pray together. So there's nobody, nobody's going to be shamed out or left back in their seat. I want everybody to come forward. If you want to drop something in the basket, just drop it in there, okay? Because we're going to pray together as a church today. I think we need to. You know, it's exciting when you see people who give. I mean, obviously, they, you know, some can give more than others. Some can give more often than others. It has nothing to do with any of that. It, it's, it's refreshing and exciting and so encouraging just to see people giving because they believe in something. You know, it's not about believing in a building, folks. It's about believing in a ministry. Ministries done outside of buildings. They're done in, ministries done at home, in tents, even today as we speak. Some people don't have a place to worship. You know, there are, there are countries today, guys, that, that have to worship underground. They have to, they have to worship in, in hidden places. Man, look at, look. And if some of you have been, how many of you have been here since 1966? Well, I don't mean on planet Earth. How many of you have been, <laughs> how many of you have been in this church since 1966? Yeah, we, we still have some charter members and some of them who have been here for a long time. Absolutely. We believe in this place. We do. And God has used this church, this place, that parking lot, this building, many, many times over the years to reach people. People to be saved, join the church, do ministry, go off somewhere else. And so we're just continuing that this morning. So join hands with somebody today, if you will. Father, thank you. You know what? Lord, as we stand before you this morning, my heart's moved. It, God, it's not about money. Lord, it's about people. It's about people that just simply love you, Lord. They want to be obedient to you. They want to give some expression, Lord, of their love for you. Maybe it's giving something back in return. Lord, you've blessed my life so much. I, Lord, we're trying to get your house put back together. Lord, you know there's been so many things here that we've had to fix and repair and replace. But we're not going to give up. We're just simply not giving up. And so today we're starting this fund, this, this fund, Lord, this money, this, this, this offering, so that we can move forward and continue to add to it, continue to surplus it, God, so that we can put a roof on this building, so that we can get air conditioners, Lord, so people can be comfortable. And whatever else we need to do, Lord, we're just going to keep moving forward and forward and forward, marching on there. So today, Lord, bless this. I know that you'll bless this. I pray that you will. And I pray that you'll take every dollar, Lord, and help us to manage it to the best of its ability in all that we do. And Jesus, I pray a special blessing on everyone gathered. Lord, that you will just take it. We just want to add to that this morning. Lord, we pray for Vacation Bible School coming up. Lord, we pray for the souls of children to be saved. We pray for the teachers that you'll use them to lead, just to lead and to minister. Father, I pray this morning for those who lead small groups here on Sunday mornings. For those who lead worship in the media and everywhere else, God, I pray this morning that you will just bless people. Thank you for the people who are not here yet. Because we're never going to stop reaching people. Never going to try. Never going to stop trying. Thank you for the diversity of our church. Not just in age. Not just socioeconomically. But in color and race and everything else. Thank you for that, God. We, we feel that is a, such an awesome privilege. And so today, Holy Spirit of God, may you, may you, whatever way we need to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, that about does it. I said that'll do it. How about you? Amen. Okay. Well, I want you just to go and enjoy your afternoon.
make sure you make someone feel welcome. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have um, Thank you. some of you on it's the good finance to see you guys. team or, or a couple of uh, Rick and uh, Tony maybe come up and give this. No. And I think Sharon and can maybe Jane can help. Uh, we're gonna, hey guys, we're going to count this later and we will send out an email tomorrow letting you know how much we got, okay? We don't want to detain you here, but we'll let you know tomorrow how much we collected with this, okay? And we can just shout, praise God for that, okay? All right, God bless you, have a good afternoon.